For the second part of this lecture, we're going to talk about the campaign in the South. You know, <clears throat> this brings us in, the South kind of reflects the third British strategy. You know, the British weren't so recalcitrant that they were above learning, okay? After, in 1778, well, the first thing they do is they relieve William Howe of command, uh, and eventually Sir Henry Clinton, one of, who had been one of his subordinates, becomes uh, the commander of, of the American war effort. And first thing he does, I should say, is 1778, a major strategic thing happens. Because of the control of the North, because of the victory at Saratoga, the French uh, throw in with the American rebels. They recognize us uh, as a nation, and, we, we, and because of Ben Franklin's uh, diplomacy, we are able to forge the French alliance, you know, 1778. And I should say, um, make no mistake about this, among one of the most important things, it, it's, it's fair to say, the French are in many ways the mothers of American freedom. It's just true. Without the support of the French alliance, without this powerful nation state supply, the help of their navy, the breaking of blockades, an additional amount of professionalization that was lent to our military efforts here, we wouldn't have won the war. We wouldn't have won neither the conventional war and probably would have ultimately lost the unconventional war in the long run. So 70, the entrance of the French into the war is, is of uh, almost inestimable uh, uh, value. So the British response to all of this. Sir Henry Clinton is put in charge. They, of course, give up for the period of time on reconquering the northern colonies. You know, they sort of look across the landscape of the American colonies and say, okay, where, where can we still get a foothold and what really matters? You know, most of the money, do you know where the money was being made as far as the British were concerned of these American colonies? Well, they were in the West Indies, the Caribbean, and the Deep South the plantation economies, right? The slave-driven, uh, export-driven plantation economies of the South and the Caribbean had always been the real money makers for the British Empire, for all the European empires. And they also had, especially <coughs> in the South, South Carolina and Georgia, North Carolina, a fairly large and motivated number of loyalists. There were a lot of loyal leaning citizens of those colonies in the South ready to take up arms and organize themselves on behalf of the British. And so all of the focus for the second half of the war is about taking the South, conquering it, and keeping it. They also, it gave them a better ability to combat France, because the first thing they do when the French make this alliance is, of course, declare war on France. And one of the best ways to engage France in this war was in the Caribbean, where the, where the French also have holdings. The British also changed their strategy. You know, by 1778, they realized that this was not just some, some simple European nation-state war of maneuver. They got it. They got that this is a war of attrition. They didn't necessarily use those words, but they understood that this colonial rebellion, this civil war, had a huge and ever-expanding social communal component that had to be addressed. They had to start engaging in the battle for the hearts and minds of the citizenry. And they had to create a strategy in which to do that. And the strategy they come up with, uh, at least on paper, is a pretty thoughtful and direct one. One that they probably should have employed from the very, very beginning. And it's called pacification. They call it pacification. The idea of pacifying uh, the South initially and then all of the colonies. You know, they see the South as sort of the uh, soft white underbelly of the American colonies. And if they could get a foothold there and sort of pacify the population and win them over institutionally and culturally and socially, they could then retake the North. There was a couple of components to uh, this pacification. You know, the first thing was an invasion. And they had planned several amphibious invasions of the major seaport cities. Initially, it would be Savannah, and then later it would be Charleston. And those actually uh, both are, are incredibly successful. I mean, some of the most, you know, uh, striking British successes of the American Revolution. And they would begin moving northward. You would start at the south in Georgia, and you would move north. 
But unlike they did before with this sort of rapid advance, just driving the Patriots out as fast as they could and pursuing them wherever they went, they would move forth incredibly slowly. So that when you took an area, a small territory area, you would not only put a loyalist militia in charge, but you would actually take the time to arm them, to train them to be a more effective defensive force against the Patriot militias in case they should return, to give them the authority and the institutions of law and order, to actually put a political body back in place, one that was elected, right, to create all of the trappings of stability, of legitimacy, of an effective uh, society, right, one that was more stable, one that they could, once the British soldiers leave, leave behind a more self-sustaining, stable, loyalist community. And part of that plan also relied on the complete and total eradication of patriots wherever they could get them, right? They had to kill them all off or drive them out permanently. But as long as you could, you know, train and prepare this more uh, sophisticated and, and sort of stable institutions of loyalists before moving on, not being in such a rush to push out the uh, colonial soldiers and the patriots, you could move forward in this sort of slow, direct, plotting and purposeful way, pacifying and retaking each part of the South, right, and really tying it all together. You know, and a big part of this whole policy, too, was to change the behavior of the British soldiers. They'd gotten it. They'd understood exactly how far and what a problem the abusive behavior of these loyalist militias and the British troops during occupation had been towards pacifying any area. And they did really want to make that mistake. In fact, Sir Henry Clinton uh, actually puts forth this direct order. He tells them to pay particular attention to restrain the loyalist militias and the British soldiers from offering violence <coughs> to innocent and inoffensive people. And by all means in your power, protect the aged, the infirm, the women, and the children from insult and outrage. You know, reading this and thinking about this, the fact he had to spell out those exact things, telling soldiers don't hurt women, children, the sick, and the old tells you exactly the nature of the abuse that they had been perpetrating in the other places they had occupied. You can kind of get a sense of why the neutrals became so patriot-leaning any time British soldiers rolled through or occupied a territory. But nonetheless, they had recognized that this, this idea of foraging as a problem that had to be contained. And basically, you couldn't move forward to the next area, to the next territory, until you had sufficiently pacified the area you occupied, right? You didn't want to leave behind a sea of rebels or angry neutrals or destabilized communities. You wanted to be able to move forth, right, with a sense of purpose and security, not always having to be watching your back. And tactically, starting in 1778, it went off really well. In fact, between 1778 and 1780, the British win a series of major battles all throughout the South. They start in Savannah with a successful um, amphibious invasion. They move up through Georgia. They take Charleston in, in, in 1780, and they're in North Carolina, really in control tactically of, of the South within a two-year period. However, strategically, pacification fails, and it fails for a number of reasons. You know, and I, I, one of the main reasons is this. In spite of Sir Henry Clinton's order about proper behavior and no foraging, the British Army and their loyalist lackeys can never restrain themselves. They still are far too abusive and hostile towards the general population, the neutral citizens, and then anyone who wasn't, you know, ferociously and ardently loyalist was a target for reprisals and abuse and violence and deprivation. And also, you know, part of the problem was a practical one, that as British soldiers moved further and further from the coast, often into semi-hostile territories, their supply lines do become thin. You know, later in the war, that's one of the big problems for General Cornwallis. Uh, everywhere he goes, he can only be so far from the coast where he can be resupplied. And the way you resupply yourself in a, in a war, particularly a war of occupation, is stealing from the general populace, occupying their properties, stealing their food and their goods, 
And you know, people don't often willingly give that up, so you use violence and intimidation in order to do that. The problems of foraging and, and perpetrating abuse on uh, the neutral citizenry remained a problem. It continued to f turn otherwise soft patriots, neutrals, or even loyalist-leaning citizens into patriots, or at least patriot-leaning citizens. Same thing happened. They couldn't rein it in. It was a good idea, but they didn't do it. Another problem was this. The British soldiers never stayed anywhere long enough to truly pacify an area. You know, the truth is, the British Army, like many modern armies, like armies throughout all times, are not really built for this kind of society building, right? To build up these, you know, durable and vibrant civilian democratic structures that can resist, you know, outside guerrilla militias and will sustain law and order when you leave. I mean, that's not what most militaries are designed to do, right? The British military, like many militaries, was designed for, uh, you know, the singular purposes of maximizing their ability to kill and maximizing their ability to destroy property and things. I mean, lit seriously, that, that is what a military does. That is, that is how wars were won, right? To be very efficient in the application of destructive deadly power. And by the way, the British military was very good at that. In fact, they were exceedingly good at it, one of the best in the world, right? But they really weren't, it's one thing to have a plan of pacification, but no one there had been trained to do it. No one really had a real plan of how you might do it. And more importantly, they had no uh, unit of measurement to know when a place really had been pacified. How would you know people had been sufficiently trained or that law and order was you know, established well enough or that this sort of civilian forces you were trained up to act as a police force and a defensive force right, is truly capable of withstanding these pretty nasty and dedicated patriot guerrillas once you leave. They had no way to know this. They didn't really have the training in this. As we know, these are still challenges for modern uh, militaries everywhere, particularly the American military in places we occupy. These questions come up again and again. You know, Great Britain is the superpower occupying the colonial rebellion territory at that point in time. These questions were important and vibrant and central, you know, 200 and some odd years ago, go and they are now. It remains a very, very key component to these wars and trying to understand this and craft a way of dealing with it strategically is at the very heart of success. And so the British often were too optimistic. They would leave places before they were pacified. Also, because of how they were built, they were always far more interested in fighting, in finding some patriot force, whether that's an organized militia force or the actual Continental Army, and chasing them, meeting them in battle. It's what they were designed to do. And so they would often abandon these areas. And again, as soon as they abandoned these areas, the patriot militias came back. And that may have been the biggest mistake they made. They could never defeat, destroy, or ultimately eradicate these patriot militias. They could drive them off, and they even had a lot of loyalist support in the South. But Patriot militias were really good at hiding out in the somewhat inaccessible swamps of uh, Georgia and South Carolina, along the frontiers of North Carolina, South Carolina, and the communities in, in Georgia as well. You know, they were, they were hard to pin down, right? They were very good. Being a, uh, an unconventional military force, you have this ability to kind of disperse and regroup in a somewhat amorphous way that is awful hard to get your fist around, right? And they couldn't, part of the most important part of the plan, eradicating now those guys never happens. And once again, the certainty that the British soldiers will leave and they can't guarantee your security and the fact their presence there was jeopardizing your security in the first place and the fact that the Patriots come back. They always come back. And when they do, they put the screws to you. They threaten violence. They commit acts of violence. Your life your future, your security is in jeopardy. And the one thing everyone could be certain of is that the only future you had, the only secure future you had, or at least potential for a secure future, lay with the Patriot cause, not with the British Army and not with the Loyalists. Just as in the North, what we found is in these areas that had been quickly conquered and supposedly pacified by 1780, had erupted into this sort of destabilizing civil war again. They had become ungovernable with large groups of people siding with the Patriot cause, joining the Patriot militias, volunteering after oath to join the Continental Army, 
you know, eventually, eventually Nathaniel Green will actually bring a legitimate conventional force down to reconquer the South. And when he gets there, he finds most of it has already been turned over to the Patriots anyway. Very few of these loyalist, pacified governments were still standing or had any control, right? So he's able to mop that up fairly quickly. You know, after that fails, the British give up. Well, they don't give up. They give up on pacification. They go back pretty much to a straight up war of maneuver. Cornwallis leads the land forces. This is fairly well known history. They do pretty well, tactically. They move quickly through Virginia, but ultimately, this war of maneuver fails. And it fails with a great disaster on the peninsula of Yorktown in Delaware, where the French Navy, combining with Washington and his conventional uh, and now very professionalized, very well-trained, very prepared Continental Army, pin in Cornwallis' forces, defeat him at the Battle of Yorktown, accept his defeat in 1781. But 1781, the fighting is pretty much over. The British are holed up exclusively to areas in New York City, parts of Rhode Island, and the rest of the colonies are under Patriot control. That's sort of the twin efforts of the growing sophistication and, and orderly leadership and dedication and bravery of the Continental Army, the foreign alliances that it was able to forge with the French, coupled with the grassroots, dark, violent certainty of patriot militia return and the unpredictability and the abuse of the British Army and their loyalist lackeys had created a thoroughly radicalized patriot-leaning population by 1781. And the fact that so many of the people had come to joining up with the revolution on the side of the revolutions through less than direct means, that maybe they didn't start out this war as committed radical patriots, lovers of egalitarian ideology, right? They may have came there as neutrals or under duress or just seeking security. It didn't really matter. And it didn't really matter for a couple reasons. One, you know, regardless of how you get there, the day you have a gun in your hand and you have a group of people with you and you put your life on the line under fire or and more importantly, you commit these acts of violence towards people on the other side, it is hard to remain or hold on to any pre-existing disinterest, neutrality, right? You do become, in a practical, concrete, life-altering way, a member of this movement. Everyone knows that. These experiences don't wash off of you. Regardless of how you got there, the experience itself, Continental Army, violent member of the militia, having experienced abuse at the hands of British troops or loyalists, right? All of that will create an experience in which the ideologies that you end up fighting for, regardless of why you ended up fighting for them, the ideologies you fought for will become the ideologies you'll embrace, you'll put into practice. You know, by 1783, most of these Americans, ex-colonists, most of the Americans, you know, they chose to remember the valorious sacrifice and efforts they made, no matter how small, towards the creation of this new American republic. And mostly to forget maybe their initial reluctance to join the cause in the first place. But either way, that helps explain how we won that grand strategy, right? How did the hearts and minds get converted? It wasn't just they read a pamphlet and were inspired by locking in liberalism. Right? These things happen in a far more complex, dangerous, uneasy way. That's a revolution. That's a civil war. That's how this story is played out with other ideologies and other revolutions in other places. In our case, it worked out pretty well because the ideologies of the American Revolution were and are noble. They were worthy. They were worth dying for and fighting for. Let's talk about what all this means. What do we say this? You know, this is just one way to analyze the American Revolution. There's many ways we could analyze the American Revolution and come up with a clear, true, meaningful understanding of what happened. And 
you know, what I wanted to do is I, by giving both the Continental Army and these Patriot guerrilla militias their due in this idea of grand strategy, it allows us to capture two things. We can hold on to some of the really important, heroic, borderline, mythical aspects of bravery and sacrifice, forethought, grand strategy that is important, important to us now, important as to understanding the revolution, important to the American character his historically, and yet it allows us to import a more modern, perhaps a more sophisticated and nuanced understanding of war and combat and violent struggle in general. It allows us to not ignore the last 150 years of war experience in America and across the globe. Right? We are educated by that. And what we learn about the American Revolution from that perspective helps us make clear and more precise analytical judgments and effective policies in modern times. That's what history can do for us, right? We can look at our struggles now, realizing one day they will be part of history too. We're making history every day. And we can import from the analysis of the past meaningful policies into the present. That's where an analysis like this has strength, has resilience, has value. And, you know, what I want to say is this, is that you can choose to tell all kinds of different stories about the American Revolution, right? And I mean this, you choose, a historian, anyone who recounts the past is making a choice to choose a narration, to pick a story. And, you know, you could choose to focus on, you know, uh, the ideology and the efforts to create the initial state governments during the Revolution as the embodiment of both Enlightenment philosophy and true democratic egalitarianism. Right? And, and how that happens. And that would be just as close and just as important to understanding the true meaning of the revolution as the narrative I just gave you about the importance of violent militia guerrilla fighters promoting and winning the hearts and minds. One's no better than the other. I just chose a different story. But that story is equally value. You could tell the story of the role of Africans and African Americans fighting on both the sides of the loyalists and the patriots and the questions of slavery and how that played out into the creation of this new republic during the revolution and that's an equally valid story and that would tell us an equally important message that tells us about then and now that we can use we could talk about the changing roles of women during the revolution and in the early national period and how revolutions afford these sort of moments where traditional societies and mores and restrictions are turned on their head right that's an important story you know, my thought is this, is that regardless of whatever story you choose to tell, it's important that you do two things. One, you make an effort to take everything we know about all of history, all of experience up to this point, up to modern times, and use it to interpret, to enlighten, to expand, to make meaningful the stories we tell in the past. And furthermore, you take from those stories in the past something meaningful and vibrant that helps us condition and shape the histories we make into the future. Thank you.